And so now I'll move on to today. So our speaker is uh, uh, Jessica Cooperstone. Um, so so she's a uh, associate professor in the Department of uh, Departments of Horticulture and Crop Science and Food Science and Technology at the Ohio State University and uh, was hired under OSU's uh, Foods for Health Focus area of the Discovery Themes Initiative. Uh, she received her Bachelor's of Science in uh, Food Science from Cornell University and her PhD in Food Science and Technology from the Ohio State University. And uh, she and her team are interested in understanding the chemical basis for the health benefits associated with fruit and vegetable rich diets. And from uh, fundamental studies in crops to nutrition based clinical trials, her group works across the plant food nutrition health continuum. And Jess and her team are located at the interface of plant food nutrition sciences and utilize bioinformatics approaches, which is what she's going to talk about today. Um, and so with that, I will turn over control of the screen to Jess. And thank you for being here, Jess. Yeah, glad to be here. So let me start the share here and this. Whoops. This is what I want. That looks OK, Luke. Yes, uh, that looks good to me. Okay, super. Um, okay, so thanks, Luke, for inviting inviting me to come and talk to the Solanaceae community. So my group works on some different fruits and vegetables, but I uh, I would say that tomatoes might be uh, may, maybe they're not our favorite, but tomatoes are the ones we've been working on the longest. So we really have the most sort of. Um, the most sort of data and information from tomato. And so just a little bit like about my team and what we do. So um, we're really interested in understanding the chemical basis for the health benefits we see in fruit and vegetable rich diets. And so, um, you know, what is it specifically about fruits and vegetables that are imparting their benefits? Is it their fiber or it's some of their phytochemicals? And the reason why I'm kind of interested in in nailing this down is because if we want to say, make our fruits and vegetables better, we need to really know what to enrich for. And so sort of linking these chemical components of our fruits and vegetables to human health outcomes is of interest to me for that reason. Um, so we work in lots of different systems. So we, we study plants themselves. We grow plants in the field and in the greenhouse, make crosses. Um, and then we take our plants and we apply them in cell culture, in animal studies, in human clinical trials, and use coding and informatics to try to integrate data together with this sort of big picture goal of, of being able to sort of, in a scientifically sound way, uh, improve the quality of our fruits and vegetables. And so I wanted to start by including a picture of my team, sort of past and present, of folks who have been working on these projects and are doing a lot of the work that I'm going to present today. So the folks with the tomatoes are the, the folks who I'll talk about today. So I'll talk about some work done by Michael, Mallory, Jenna, Maria, Daniel, and Aaron. Okay. Um, so tomatoes and their consumption has been consistently associated with positive health outcomes. So tomatoes sort of started generating interest in the in the sort of nutrition space. Oh, and I should say, I have the chat open. So if anybody has any questions or thoughts during the talk, please feel free to drop it in the chat. I can see that and I can try to incorporate that uh, sort of as we go. So the the kind of this started to the the relationship between tomato consumption and positive human health outcomes started um, from some epidemiology studies that were in the, that that happened in the 90s. So one is part of the health professionals follow up study. So this is a, a long term epidemiological study that follows health professionals and tracks what they eat and uh, lots of other lifestyle factors about these individuals and then and then also looks at the diseases that they end up getting and so studies like this, sorry, the dog is snoring in the background. I hope that's not too loud. Um, so what they try to do is then correlate what people eat to the diseases or the conditions that they end up developing. And, and in a one particular study, what they did is they looked at a variety of different fruits and vegetables and try to correlate all of these different fruits and vegetables to different cancer outcomes. And what they found 
actually this was a, a, a question in prostate cancer, cancer specifically, and what they found in this study is that actually consumption of tomatoes, either as tomatoes, as tomato sauce, or even as pizza, was correlated with a decreased risk for the development of prostate cancer. And so the scale of this is something like the people in the highest quintile of intake, so the top 20% of tomato consumers who consumed about 10 servings of tomato a week, so a little bit more than one serving per day, had something like a 30% decreased risk for the development of prostate cancer. And for context as to like what that might mean, if, um, if somebody was at high familial risk for prostate cancer, they might get put on a, ca a prostate cancer prophylactic drug like finasteride, um, in a preventative manner. And drugs like that also reduce risk for the development of prostate cancer at about 30%. And so um, quickly, this relationship between tomatoes um, and prostate cancer was like honed in on lycopene, the pigment in, in tomatoes that makes them red. Of course, we know not all tomatoes are red. Um, and and these this epidemiological finding has been consistent over studies. It has also been um, consistent in other and other sort of disease states sometimes. So in in heart disease, um, and then we've also seen sort of other relationships that we're still trying to understand and explain. Like for example, if you give people a diet rich in tomatoes and then expose them to a dose of UV light to induce a sunburn, what you find is that the people who have been consuming tomatoes get less red and have a less like a dampened immunological response. Um, suggesting that something about consuming the tomatoes is causing this effect. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about lycopene, which is the compound that's gotten the most attention for providing health benefits in tomatoes. Um, and then I'm going to move on to talking about some other work that we're doing more recently in our group. And so I think before we start writing prescriptions for people for pizza, this is something we should really better understand so we can make good recommendations. And so um, I'm interested in tomatoes for lots of reasons. I, I got into tomatoes because I sort of started working on them. I got tasked with working on them when I was a graduate student and I stuck with tomatoes for the reasons that I'm gonna explain here. And so um, the first is that tomatoes are the second most commonly consumed vegetable in a, in, a, in a Western diet. They're second to potato. And I know this is a Solanaceae community, but I think nutritionally potato is not, not so much of a, potato is more of a starch than it is a vegetable. So people consume about 30 pounds a year of tomatoes. Most of those are as processed products. So they're they're consumed a lot. And so again, if kind of get back to like my rationale for doing this in the first place, which is that we wanna be able to improve the fruits and vegetables that we eat. It makes sense to me to improve things that people already like. Um, anybody who's ever really tried to substantively change their diet knows truly how difficult that is to do. And so if we can improve the things that people already like, to me, that's a that's a win-win. Um, and then from a plant perspective, tomatoes have just unrivaled genetic diversity by which we can harness. And so you can see this at the grocery store, you can see this in the tomato genetics, germ, the tomato germplasm repository center. There's so much variation in terms of the types of compounds that tomato, make, tomato makes, and this we can utilize to ask our nutritional questions. Um, and then the resources that are available to work in tomato, it being both a crop and a model species is really sort of un unparalleled. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about lycopene and a little bit about two different types of tomatoes. So a regular a kind of a, this is the tomato on the left is the kind of tomato that you would find in a can. This is a processing style tomato. Um, it accumulates lycopene, it's red pigment primarily. Um, I hope my, my mouse is working here to point, um, primarily as, all trans lycopene. This is a thank you, thank you, Luke. Um, this is a linear molecule, and the the tomato makes lycopene in this configuration. There are some naturally occurring mutants of tomatoes, like excuse me, like the one on the right called tangerine, which is called tangerine because of its color, not because of its citrus relationship, um, but which is uh, accumulates lycopene in a, in quite a different configuration. So it accumulates lycopene in this. Um, tetra cis configuration. So it has four hindered cis bonds. And what this does is it changes the physical structure of this molecule. The, so these are geometric isomers of each other. And so what's kind of interesting is that when we feed, so, so tomatoes are like 95% of the lycopene exists as all trans lycopene. But when you feed tomatoes to people or to animals, what you find is an enrichment of these cis isomers in blood and tissue. So about half of the lycopene found in like a mammal that has been eating tomatoes 
is in these cis configurations. And so that sort of leads to the question of like, why, why is this happening? And there are two reasons why this can happen. And we have evidence that both are true. One is that these cis forms are present in tomatoes um, at lower concentrations, but they're better absorbed. And that's why we see them more in people. So that's true. Um, but I think the main reason is because we get conversion from trans to cis in vivo. Okay. And so these orange colored tomatoes sort of naturally contain lycopene in this cis configuration. And so for those who like pathways, these uh, tangerine tomatoes lack a functional um, copy of this enzyme carotenoid isomerase, which converts tetracyclic lycopene into all trans lycopene. And as a function of that, you get accumulation of the compounds that come upstream of lycopene and really none of the compounds that are downstream. Um, and so the question that I had wanted to ask is, might a tomato like this, that it has lycopene already and it's mostly in cis forms, be um, provide a more bioavailable form of lycopene for people? So would people absorb more lycopene from these orange tomatoes? And so what we did is a clinical trial um, where we brought people into the clinic. We had them not consume tomato products for a couple of weeks. We brought them into the clinic. We would put a catheter in their arm and then we would uh, take a baseline sample and feed them a meal containing either um, the red tomato or the orange tomato, both the same dose of lycopene and collect blood over the over the time. And what we can do is then take those blood samples. We can isolate something called the chylomicron rich lipoprotein fraction, which is the fraction of blood that represents sort of newly absorbed lipophilic compounds. And we can analyze those for our coronoids of interest. And what we find is that when people consume lycopene from our tangerine tomatoes, they absorb um, about eightfold more. And so the difference is like almost 50% absorption as compared to about 5% absorption. And so we think that this is a function of the lycopene being in these different configurations. So again, you have the tangerine tomatoes, which I don't know why it keeps moving. I'm gonna stop using my mouse. Um, so the, the tangerine tomatoes have lycopene in this cis configuration. And so this, this cis configuration is also related to how carotenoids are physically stored within the tomato, um, the tomato chromoplast. And so on the left, you can see two light micrographs that come from a red and an orange uh, in the tangerine tomato. And what we see in the red tomato is that lycopene exists in the chromoplast as these crystals. These You can sort of see these crystal-like projections with the arrows. And when you look at the orange tangerine tomatoes, what you see is something basically that even if you're not a microscopist, I'm not, I'm not really a microscopist, um, that looks not like these crystals. And so when you use electron microscopy, you can get some better resolution here. And what, what you end up finding is that lycopene in red tomatoes is stored as crystals. These are crystal remnants. And this has been documented in the literature from like the 50s that this is what um, uh, tomato chromoplast looks like. But what we see in these orange color tomatoes are carotenoids and lycopene deposited in these plastoglobules, these lipid dissolved um, organelles within the chromoplast. And so this has also real implications in terms of absorption. So because the lycopene from the orange tomatoes is in cis configurations, it will not form a crystal. And as a result, it is not in the form of a crystal in the tomato itself. And so if we think about how you might absorb something that's a lipophilic crystal, the first step would be to dissolve that crystal so that it can be absorbed in the intestine. And so that's sort of an extra step that's required for the absorption of lycopene in its all transform from a red tomato that you don't have from these orange colored tomatoes. And so we think that it's both a combination of the isomeric form, which dictates the physical storage form in the tomato that's contributing to such a huge increase in bioavailability from the orange tomatoes. And so this is though not exactly all good. And so the way that the carotenoid is in the tomato also affects how stable that those compounds are going to be to things like food processing. So I think probably most folks have made tomato sauce and sort of noticed anecdotally that like you can cook the tomato sauce for like a super long time before you get what could be like any noticeable change in color, like the red, the red color of the tomato. And lycopene in, in kind of red tomatoes is extremely stable to food processing. You can process a lot, a lot without really getting um, decrease or isomerization. But these orange tomatoes, these tangerine tomatoes, that is not the case. What we find is that as we cook these tomatoes, we get huge decreases 
in the concentration of tetracyclic lycopene, which is that predominant lycopene form in these tomatoes. And so we think though, that this is also because these, what, what makes these compounds more bioavailable also makes them more susceptible to degradation during food processing. And so this is something that we wanna think about or that we would wanna think about if we we're trying to deliver lycopene and we're trying to figure out in what, in what way might it be best to provide if, we, if the goal is to administer lycopene. And so this has real implications in food processing. And this is some um, tangerine tomato soup that Campbell's was making for a minute. Okay, and so if we think about these same sort of red versus tangerine dichotomy in models of disease, what we can what we see in studies is that um, if we feed, this is a prostate cancer model, if we feed animals um, a diet either with the red or the tangerine tomatoes, what we see in the blood at least is huge increases in lycopene in the blood of these animals when we feed the tangerine tomatoes. But what's interesting is if we look at how much disease these animals get, so this is a, a study in a genetic model of prostate cancer for mice that are predisposed to get prostate cancer, what we see is actually the same amount of disease reduction, about 40 or 50% in both of the tomato diets, suggesting that there's really impact of, of tomato, um, but actually doesn't so much seem like we're seeing differences between the two diets. And what we would expect again, is if lycopene is the predominant bioactive, that more lycopene would be less disease. And that's not what we see. So we can look at this in other models too. So we can see how eating tomatoes is related to the development of non-melanoma skin cancer. So this is another mouse study. Um, non-melanoma skin cancer is not the kind of cancer that people die from. It's the kind of cancer that's like so common that actually it doesn't even get counted in cancer databases. So this is the kind of cancer that people mostly get on skin exposed sites. You might find it, folks get it like on their face and it needs to be removed or on their hands. Um, and so we did a study where we fed animals um, either a control diet or a diet with the red tomatoes or the tangerine tomatoes. And we wanted to see what their development of skin cancer is like. A lot of this work stemmed from these observations that you had a dampened inflammatory response when people consumed tomatoes as compared to when they didn't. And so we could think, and we could try to sort of take some of what we know about how carotenoids and uh, function in plants as accessory pigments and they're involved in the photosynthetic synthetic apparatus to help scavenge free radicals that occur during this light intensive process of photosynthesis. And again, we could say, well, maybe this is a, a mechanism by which these compounds are working to prevent, um, uh, to, to cause a dampened response when exposed to a, a, do a big dose of light uh, in UV. And so what we find in this study, so this is a the skin cancer study done. This is now we're looking actually in the skin of these animals. What we find is much higher levels of lycopene in the animals consuming the tangerine tomato diet. But what we see is really no real effect. Again, an overall decreased number of tumors of about 40 to 50% in the animals consuming tomatoes, but no real increase, no increased efficacy when you provide more lycopene. And so um, what this made me start to think is like, maybe we should be looking at some other compounds that are present in the tomatoes to understand what they might be doing. So I think for folks who work in plants, I don't need to tell you all that, you know, tomatoes are not delivery vehicles for lycopene, but complex mixtures that contain hundreds and thousands of different phytochemicals, all of which could potentially have some bioactivity. And so uh, to sort of zoom out to, to get at this, I wanted to ask the question, what other non-carotenoid phytochemicals are accumulating? So we're seeing both in the prostate cancer study and in the skin cancer study that I just mentioned, we're seeing a, a really strong effect of tomato consumption in terms of reducing the prevalence of these chronic diseases. And this is just, I mean, this is just eating tomatoes. Um, and so what I thought that we maybe would, would do is say like, what other compounds are we finding in our systems, what other compounds derive from tomato, which might give us some hints at which compounds might be bioactive. And so what we did, what I did to kind of investigate this was a metabolomic style approach. So what we could do is we could take the mice on the control diets, on the red tomato diets, on the, on the tangerine tomato diets, and use metabolomics 
to see what compounds are different in the skin of these animals. And the compounds that really stood out from this analysis were steroidal alkaloids. And so um, what we found, or what I found in the skin of these animals is uh, a whole slew of steroidal, what looked like in vivo steroidal alkaloid metabolites present in the skin of these animals. And so we know that we have compounds like alpha tomatine and there are others um, within the tomato. And it's plausible that these compounds could be derived from alpha tomatine. And so what we could, uh, so, uh, so this is the first report that you find in the literature of tomato steroidal alkaloids being absorbed. Um, before this, it was thought that they were just excreted they were just not absorbed and they just sort of went right through digestion. And so what are these tomato glycoalkaloids? So these are cholesterol derived. So they look a lot like cholesterol for the chemists who like looking at structures. They're steroidal, um, meaning that they look like a steroid and they're nitrogen containing. And you can see the nitrogen over here in the, in the F ring. Um, these specific alkalo glycoalkaloids are found only in the tomato clade. There are other steroidal alkaloids that you find in other in other Solanaceae. So the ones in potatoes are different. The ones in eggplants are different than the ones you see in tomatoes. Um, so they're found only in the tomato clade. So if you kind of go back to the epi, I think the kind of quick relationship that folks made between tomato consumption and lycopene was because lycopene is one of those carotenoids that's not found that much, at least in a Western diet in foods other than tomatoes. Something like 80% of people's lycopene comes from tomatoes. You can find small, lower concentrations in foods that people tend to eat seasonally, like pink grapefruits and watermelons and papayas. Um, but in any case, these compounds, these tomato, these steroidal alkaloids are found only in tomato. Um, what's interesting is that there's been some literature, some information literature for a long time that they're protective against fusarium and that tomatoes that totally lack steroidal alkaloids really struggle from a pathogen perspective. There's also data that suggests that they are protective against herbivory. And then if you look at the human health kind of relevant information, relevant literature, you can find that there is evidence for bioactivity in vitro and, and in vivo. Um, and the one that I wanted to kind of focus on is that there have been some studies that have been fed purified steroidal alkaloids and find that when you do this, you can reduce plasma cholesterol. Um, and so fortunately, I have a like, a, so once we found this in the mice, I have a freezer full of blood of people who have been consuming tomato containing diets. So I can say, do we find uh, steroidal alkaloid metabolites in those human plasma samples? And so what we find in the tomato could be something like alpha tomatine and what we could hypothesize based on what we know about mammalian um, metabolism, absorption and metabolism is that this these sugars might get cleaved and what we might find in the blood would be something that looks like tomatidine and, and this is actually what we find. And so this led to a bunch of new questions for us. For example, how do tom tomato steroidal alkaloids exist across the tomato clade? How do they get absorbed? Um, but in order to do a lot of this, what we needed first are robust and quantitative methods for steroidal alkaloid analysis. And, and for a variety of reasons, this wasn't really present in the literature in a quantitative way. And so what Michael Djokovic, who uh, was a former PhD student in my lab, did was work on developing a method, a quantitative mass spectrometry based method that allows the analysis of these compounds. And so here you can see all the slew of tomato steroidal alkaloids that we can analyze. Um, you see here two potatoes. This is alpha solanine and solanidine, which we use in our method as our internal standards. And so now having a method enables us to, to, to understand diversity and to study other aspects. Um, what we also did, and this is something that JL from my group did, is he went, we were sort of interested to know now that we have methods like what are the levels, what are the approximate levels of these steroidal alkaloids that we find just in products that people would be exposed to? So we went to the grocery, bought a bunch of stuff and did a bunch of analysis. And what we found really is that the amount of steroidal alkaloids that you can find in tomato products available for sale is um, roughly on par with the amount of lycopene that you find in tomatoes. So this suggests also that these compounds are present in higher concentrations than people thought it in. Uh, so, they're, they're getting absorbed, they're present at higher levels than we thought. Um, so we're, we're kind of continuing to work on these, these questions. Um, so another question that we had, and this is a project also done by Michael in collaboration with 
David Francis, who's a plant breeder and uh, tomato breeder and geneticist in my department here at Ohio State, is we were interested to understand how do steroidal alkaloids exist across the, across the tomato clade. And so what Michael did is he took a paper um, that had been published a few years ago, it was less few years ago at the time, um, that had, had done, used a SNP chip um, for like about 1000 accessions of tomato. And so what he did is he selected a little over a hundred of these accessions in different different classes of tomato. And he selected in the different groups to try to maximize, he, he picked enough samples that we could maximize the genetic diversity that we have in each of our di each of our groups. And the idea there was that if we have more genetic diversity, we might have more diversity in steroidal alkaloids. So we picked about a, a little over 100 genotypes. We replicated them in different environments, ended up with a lot of plots. And so we have tomatoes in our study that range from Solanum lycopersicum. This is the kind of tomato that you would find in a can. We also had the kind of fresh market slicer types, uh, Ceresa forme, which is a cherry tomato, both wild and cultivated, and Solanum pimpinellifolium, which are um, current sort of ancestors of modern tomato. And so this is a little bit about where those tomatoes came from in terms of their origin. And what we find is across different classes. So on these plots, the 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 the, the x-axis goes from like more cultivated to more wild. What we find, and the y-axis here at least is on a log scale, what we find is huge diversity in total steroidal alkaloids as we look um, across these different types, across these different species. And so what we find is lots of diversity in steroidal alkaloids, much lower levels in cultivated material and higher levels in wild cherry and in pimpinellifolium. And this is a lowest to the highest is maybe 100 or, two, or 500 fold. Um, so there's also difference, not just in the total amount, but in the profile uh, and in the concentration of these alkaloids. So what you can see here on the left is a principal components analysis scores plot. So this is a, we have measurements for say 10 or so different alkaloids in the tomatoes. And if we wanna like look at this kind of at a profile level all at once, we can use this dimensionality reduction approach. And so here each point is um, actually a best linear unbiased predictor value per genotype. So there's 107 points here. And what we can see is that um, a lot of the cultivated material is kind of clustering here on the left side of the plot. And then we see sort of this divergence where we see at the, uh, we see more diversity um, in wild cherry and pimpinella folium, and also a group of wild cherry, which seem to have a profile that is different from these ones over here. And so if we look at a loadings plot, we can try to understand the chemical basis for these differences. And what we end up finding is that there are, um, me animate here. So the compounds over here that are higher in these wild cherry species are in the earlier part of the biosynthetic pathway. And then the fruits that are um, up here are higher in these compounds over here, which are later in the biosynthetic pathway, which suggests there's some kind of coordinated genetic control of these compounds and their production within tomato. And so we can use um, both our diversity pa panel and also a biparental population and genome-wide association studies to try to understand where in the genome is related to, um, to this like high level of alpha tomatine. And so what we ended up finding is that there is a region on, excuse me, region on chromosome three that controls alpha tomatine content. And around the same time or just before this, um, a paper by Asaf Aharoni's group came out that found that there was um, um, that there was a gene in the same region on chromosome three that that is is a a transporter that basically shuttles alpha tomatine um, from the from the vacuole, allowing it to have uh, its additional decorations and additional conjugation in this biosynthetic pathway and. What these tomatoes have, um, some of our tomatoes that are in that bottom group on the PCA, um, do not have functional versions of those tra that transporter. And so, if we if we go kind of like from so so what we have now here are the ability to so what we we find diversity in steroidal alkaloid content in tomatoes, and this to, from my perspective is useful because now we can begin to create 
different material that is divergent in steroidal alkaloid content that we can test in our nutritional studies. And so we're doing some of that now. So we're kind of, we've continued this population um, and keep breeding to try to create material that's nearly isogenic, um, but is high in alpha tomatine. Okay, so what happens to these tomato steroidal alkaloids once they're absorbed? Um, so we've done a few different studies to try to get at this. So one is doing a study in pigs. So this was done by Mallory Goggins, a former master student in my group. And what we we selected to use pigs here because pigs are um, a more physiologically relevant model to humans than rodents. And uh, because we can collaborate with folks in animal science who do work on pigs for other reasons, um, we, we get access to this really nice model. And so what Mallory did is she took pigs, she split them into two groups. Some of them were consumed a diet supplemented with tomato, and then some consumed a control diet that had the same macronutrient composition as the tomato supplemented diet, but didn't have the tomato. And then we can take um, the different parts of the pigs and we can understand where what what compounds are going into blood and what compounds might be distributed to the different tissue. And so um, I think I had kind of said this, but maybe just in passing is that the steroidal alkaloids that are present in the tomato are different than the ones that are present that we find like in 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 blood and um, in tissue. And so what Mallory was trying to do is to figure out what compounds might we see? What what should I look for? And so how do you go about finding metabolites when you don't know what they look like. And so this was our process. So what Mallory could do is she could analyze the, the tomatoes that we fed the pigs just to know like, okay, this is what we're feeding the pigs. Then she can take her knowledge of human or mammalian metabolism and make some hypotheses about what kinds of conjugation and derivatization might be happening to those compounds. Then she can create a long list of these are the potential compounds, these are their masses, and then we can look for them in our samples. And so what we're looking for with this approach is we can say uh, the compound, so it has to sort of meet different criteria. So uh, for a compound to be considered a, a accurately annotated tomato steroidal alkaloid, it would need to be present in the tomato fed animals and absent in the control fed animals. It would need to have a mass that matches one of the masses that we could hypothesize. Um, it would need to have a retention time because we're doing this by LCMS that is sort of plausible. And then what we can also do is we can collect MS-MS fragmentation data so we can take our compounds, apply a voltage, break the molecule apart, and measure the masses of the pieces. And the measurement of those pieces can help us reconstruct what that structure is. And so in the absence of standards that you can buy, this is our approach for trying to figure out what might be steroidal alkaloid metabolites that we find in vivo. And so Mallory, uh, this was a project Mallory started and Maria has been finishing. What we find is a whole slew of these metabolites basically in blood. Okay. And so these metabolites that we see in the animals are different than what we see in tomatoes. And so we can do our best to try to figure out like what might be coming from where, but this is sort of complicated by the complicated steroidal alkaloid profile that we find in the tomatoes themselves. And then also the complicated profile that we see um, in our animals. And so we can, we, we do our best to try to link, but in the absence of tracer studies, this becomes a bit challenging. Um, so we're also interested in understanding or being able to ask questions like, to what extent are these compounds absorbed from people? So we can use um, a single dose of a tomato study to get at this question. So we fed here people two different um, doses of tomatoes. So a dose that's about two servings and a dose that's about half a serving. We have them abstain from consuming tomatoes. We bring them into our clinic. We put a catheter in their arm. We take a baseline blood sample. Then we feed them a tomato containing meal and take blood over the day. Then the subjects go home. They continue to not consume tomatoes. And then they come back and consume the other diet that they hadn't consumed previously. Um, and this is a project that has been led by Daniel Doe in my group. And what, what we found here is that absorption of tomato steroidal alkaloids ranges from about, four, about 5 to 10%. And so this is about on par in terms of how much gets absorbed um, to what we find for lycopene. And what's also interesting that Daniel finds is that there's huge variation in terms of how much gets absorbed between our subjects. So this is a small study, but subjects are all consuming the same diet, the same meal, the 
other foods in the meal are the same. You know, there's somebody sitting there making sure that they're actually eating the whole meal. Subjects are like demographically actually pretty similar. And so what we find though is about tenfold difference in total absorption between the person who absorbs the most and the least, suggesting that there are other factors that can be at play here. Others say host related factors, maybe genetics, maybe people have different expression levels of transporters, people have different microbiomes. And so we're interested to kind of understand the the, the reason for the large inter-individual in, large inter-individual variation that we see in absorption. Um, those, so I just, what I just described is kind of a targeted version of trying to find these steroidal alkaloid metabolites, like I talked about in the mouse skin study, but here in a study done and conducted in liver, this was a study conducted also by Michael. We can also use an untargeted metabolomics-like approach to find steroidal alkaloid metabolites. So we can say these are compounds we would expect to find in animals consuming tomatoes, and we would expect them to be absent in animals who aren't eating tomatoes. And what we can do, so we can do animal studies like this. Um, I'm just gonna talk about the metabolomics portion and not the RNA-seq portion. But um, this sort of big block of blue are all compounds that are absent in our control fed animals, but present in the, the animals eating the two different tomato diets here. And when we look at these, what these metabolites are, nearly all of them are, can be, can be attributed to tomato steroidal alkylate metabolites. So we find about 61 peaks or 61 features that are really, that, that we can annotate as, um, Met uh, steroidal alkaloid metabolites using um, MS and MSMS -MS techniques. So this is sort of saying that no matter how we look, no matter what system, if we look in skin or in blood or in liver, we are finding these steroidal alkaloid metabolites. And so there's, you know, we can ask a question for tomato in general, how might tomato be imparting its benefit mechanistically? And so one of the ways that has been hypothesized that tomatoes might be effect, might be, might be causing an effect is in their ability to modulate the gut microbiome. And so in that pig study I was talking about, Mallory was really interested in this question about microbiome. So she decided to do this as a little, as an, whoops, as an add on to her thesis. And so what we did is we took the pigs from that same study, and we did rectal swabs and used whole genome sequencing to, to look at the microbial populations that are present in these animals. And what we find basically is that, um, I'm gonna just actually talk about this part. I'll just talk about alpha diversity. What we find is that the, the animals on the tomato containing diets have more diverse gut microbiomes than the animals on the control diets. And so this is one thing along with an altered ratio of bacteriodoides to firmicutes, um, and those taxa have recently changed names, but I think people still use the older names more. Um, so, so this sort of increased amount of diversity is sort of suggested to be an inherent benefit as it provides functional redundancy. And so this is something that we're trying to investigate further and understand further and incorporate into our human clinical trials with better sequencing, more deeper sequencing so that we can better understand how how this kind of tomato consumption might be altering the gut microbiome. And then the last bit that I'm gonna talk about are is something that we're all also interested in from a nutrition perspective is developing tools that allow us to better understand um, uh, what, how, you know, what, what people are eating. So the most common way that, that what people eat is assessed is by something called a food frequency questionnaire. And this, these food frequency questionnaires are developed by nutritionists and dietitians. And, but basically like what they do at their cores, they ask you, okay, in the last year, how often do you consume tomatoes? Never, uh, less than, less than once per, you know, once per year, twice per year, once per month, once per week, twice per week, three to four times per week, you know, blah, et cetera, et cetera. And these questions are, they ask you these kinds of detailed questions for lots of different types of foods. And, and, and they're kind of inherently challenged for, for many reasons. One, because like people eat different things throughout the year. Two, people lie about what they eat because they want to be seen to be eating better or differently than the way that they actually eat. People just like simply cannot remember what they eat. People are bad kind of judge of like how much they're eating. And so as a result, these food frequency questionnaire type tools have like these inherent challenges. And so if we wanna relate what we eat in this case, tomatoes 
to diseases, we need to be able to measure both what people are eating and the diseases that they're getting. So measuring disease is easier, at least right now, than measuring what people are eating. And so what, what we were interested to do is, can we use metabolomics? Can we can we use some of the studies that we've done where we do controlled feedings to try to find compounds that we can look for within, like in this case, urine, that would indicate to us whether a person is consuming tomatoes or not. And so what we did is a study where, again, this we're, this was, we used this tangerine and red tomato study as our study that we used for this, this question where we're, we're consuming, the subjects are consuming different amounts, more of this orange colored tomato than the, than the red. Um, and we can use, we can use metabolomics to do a global profiling of the urine of these subjects. And what we find in this study, so at baseline, after subjects consume the tomato containing meal, you see an overall change in their metabolic profile. And so we're interested to know what compounds might be changing in their urine that could be potentially accessible for us to use as biomarkers of tomato consumption. And this was a study done by Jenna Miller started by Jenna Miller and is now being finished by Aaron Wiedemer. And so what Jenna found is that um, we can find compounds like naringenin and glucuronide. So naringenin is a flavonone that you find in tomatoes, but actually you find it in lots of different plants. What we find is that this is a compound that's low at baseline and that goes up and that is higher when you feed more tomatoes, suggesting that this might be a plausible biomarker. But what we know about plants and what we know about nutrition is that a compound like a naringenin and glucuronide might appear to be a biomarker in the case of a really controlled feeding study. But if you start to have people who are consuming tomatoes, but they're also consuming citrus and they're also consuming, you know, other other plant foods, um, I think that this this is the kind of biomarker that might not hold up to those kinds of studies. But what we do find um, are compounds that are imidazole alkaloids, which also seem to be specifically unique to tomatoes, which we're finding consistently in the urine of people who are consuming tomato containing diets. And, and since this, others have also found these same compounds. And so these compounds may be good urinary biomarkers that would like with additional testing would allow someone to take a urine sample from somebody and ID and, and sort of work towards being able to figure out what that person is eating simply by measuring their urine. So making this a more quantitative and objective analysis. And so to kind of wrap up the discussion from today, as we look forward, I hope that I've been able to convince you that that tomato consumption can provide a benefit. And we see this in animal studies. Um, but the exact reason for this um, for this is still not really clear, and that these tomato glycoalkaloids are warrant warrant some further investigation. And so um, this is kind of some of the type of work that my group does, combining targeted analyses, multi-omics techniques, and integrating um, and trying to create different plant material that allows us to test these nutritional hypotheses. So uh, I have tomatoes on my horizon. I hope that you do also. Um, and then I just want to say thanks to all the folks who contribute to these projects. This is a big interdisciplinary effort and not something that we do on our own. So the work I talked about today particularly is some work done by Daniel, Michael, Mallory, Jenna, Maria, and Aaron. Um, the the plant-focused work couldn't be done without David Francis and the microbiome studies were done in collaboration with Yasna Kovach at Penn State. And then the funding agencies that have given us support for doing this kind of work over the years. Um, and thanks to you for your attention and happy to chat about this. Great, awesome. Thanks, Jess, that was a, that was a cool talk. I, I feel like I learned a lot about that I didn't know anything about this. So uh, <laughs> uh, I have a couple of questions before we get started. The, yeah, the sure. First, the first one, just a fun question, I guess. What What is you think is the ideal way from a health perspective to eat a tomato? You know, we I get this kind of question a lot, Luke. So like, I think it's a good question. I, I think we don't know. I think my sort of advice to people would be that you should eat fruits and vegetables in whatever way is amenable to you eating them. I, I don't know that I could give you a more, um, like a more detailed answer at this point. What we do know is that compounds like lycopene are better absorbed from tomatoes that have been heated and homogenized. And so if what you want to do is get more lycopene, then you should cook your tomatoes. Um, what does more lycopene do? Can't say per se. 
But if you feel like lycopene is important to you, then what you would want to do is cook your tomatoes. Okay, cool. Thanks. The The other question I had is I wonder about like, so you have this really complex profile of metabolites that are getting ingested and then being acted on by metabolic pathways and converted into other things. If, if there are, there's a possibility for sort of complex sets of interactions between the tomato compounds and say compounds from other foods, like, does it matter what the sort of background food is? Yeah, I think it's a really thoughtful question. And to be honest, I have no idea. I think like we know so little about this, just like even from like a single compound perspective that like introducing, like I have to think that there are interaction effects, right? Like there are, you know, some of these compounds are absorbed by the same or, or absorbed using the same um proteins or transported using the same transporters and so there's like lots of opportunity for that interaction but the extent of it i i like couldn't even begin to say um and so what i the approach that i kind of like to do is can we can we make plants that have particular profiles like profiles that we know or that we've designed on purpose so that when we use them in nutrition studies, we can try to make statements about what particular compounds are doing. And we can do that on like as big of a scale as I can find money to do that kind of thing. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so it looks like uh, Pat has a question and just to everybody, if you have a question, you can either just raise your hand or type that you have a question or if you don't feel like speaking up on the microphone you could just type your question in the chat and i can read it so anyway pat do uh, you have a question yeah hi hi jessica thank you that was really interesting Thanks. um so so uh i noticed that you've you've really focused on uh even for your glycoalkaloid studies you've really focused on the red tomatoes in the mm -hmm. tomato clay but mm -hmm. I, i'm betting that david francis also tested some other wild tomato species <laughs> and i'm just curious as to what he found elsewhere and there are breeding tools where you can bring in you know certain uh sets of genes from other wild tomato species and i'm just curious is did he do that and what if so what did he find and so yeah, that's a really good question. So we limited that diversity screening that we did to um, like a persicum, sarasiforme, and, and pimps. Now actually, so Mariam is on this call too. So I haven't done any analysis beyond those species in fruit. So I have been working on a project with Mariam, but in leaves with lots more varied um species and what we find is also lots of interesting variation that we're trying to figure out so i don't know there are some papers out that that describe the steroidal alkaloid profile a little bit in some other like in hepercides and cheesemanii um but i don't know those in a quantitative way and it seems like also at least what i've learned from doing some work with mariam is that the what you see in leaf and what you see in fruit are are to me less related than I might ex than I would have expected that they were. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question, Pat. And I'll, I'll Mariam can comment more if she wants. <laughs> right. Anybody else have any other questions? We have a comment from Deidre in the chat that this was a great talk and uh, happened to be super relevant for a non-majors plants and humanity and environment course. So we'll get the that talk. We'll get this talk up on YouTube ASAP so the students can watch it. Yeah, thanks for saying that. I feel like I've like what what has been kind of cool to me about like this soul and ACA community is like all, people have such interesting and different perspectives like I started more kind of in the food and nutrition space and then moved into the plant space and I feel like I've learned so much from talking with my plant colleagues about like tools that are available and how we can kind of integrate across the space that has just been like really beneficial so I'm always like interested to hear from like the ecologists and their perspectives and all that 
Nichts von. All right, great. Um, not seeing any more questions, I don't think. Let me, if, let me know if I'm wrong. I don't see any hands raised. Um, but uh, if not, then I guess we can call it a day. And thanks, Jess, Jess again for, for the talk. And yeah, thanks for having great. me. Yeah, and uh, the next, I guess I should say the next talk is going to be, let me pull up the seminar schedule to make sure I don't uh, get the wrong date. The next talk will be November 3rd. Um, we'll have uh, Benicia Pella um, talking that time. Um, and I think that is actually, that's just before the time change in the US. So, but the one after that should be, a difference, a slight shift in the schedule, but we'll send out an email and let everybody know what's going on with that. So anyway, thanks again, Jess, and we'll see everybody next time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.